Today, we are delighted we have a special Center for Global Finance session. It is one of the series of our inaugural lectures uh, uh, for uh, um, Dirk Willem T. Verde, uh, who is now the professor of our practice uh, uh, within the Center for Global Finance at uh, SOAS University of London. So my first uh, mention is to congratulate you indeed, Dirk, uh, for you to be able to join us uh, as uh, our professor of practice. Uh, and um, so it's the first in the series in the sense that uh, uh, this inaugural lecture will also be followed by a subsequent uh, set of uh, inaugural lectures uh, in which uh, you'll be able to interface uh, with the community of researchers uh, um, within the Center for Global Finance, uh, the whole of SOAS, and of course the global network we have, uh, some of which represented uh, at the seminar today. So uh, to you all, I'd like to add uh, a very warm uh, welcome to the Center of Global Finance today. Uh, and um, 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 so it is in order for me to first uh, 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 introduce uh, um, um, uh, Professor Dirk Willem T. Verde. I'll henceforth refer her to uh, Dirk. Um, and uh, he joined us as a uh, uh, professor of practice uh, uh, within the Center for Global Finance at SOAS uh, last year in 2021. He comes with a distinguished uh, record uh, of research uh, and policy interaction, uh, which is the very essence of why uh, SOAS is awarding uh, professors of practice. Uh, indeed, in terms of uh, research and scholarship, uh, he has written and edited uh, about 20 books or monographs, uh, 30 peer-reviewed articles, uh, numerous book chapters, and all these are related to his main areas, which is in includes investment, trade, and economic transformation. I know he's going to be saying a lot about this uh, later today. And his research has indeed featured uh, in um, uh, global media, the BBC, China Daily, The Economist, Financial Times, you name it, that has been able to uh, uh, present his views at all through these uh, uh, forums. But in terms of research impact, where he has excellent performance, um, he has been able to uh, uh, cover out some pathways um, and advise donor agencies, including FCDO, uh, uh, Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, CEDA, uh, both Houses of Parliament in the UK, uh, government ministries ranging from Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Nepal, and also multilateral uh, uh, bodies, uh, including FIS and UN agencies. And um, within the UK now, he holds a distinguished position uh, as a member of the UK government's trade, strategic trade advisory group, in other words, advising the Secretary of State and Trade Minister, and leads a Bangladesh trade capacity building project. But he also, of course, ex exceptionally qualified. He holds a degree uh, from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and a PhD in economics from Backbeck uh, University of London. So, um, and Dark today um, um, uh, will be uh, speaking about a very interesting topic of uh, development financial institutions and their role in the private sector, helping us to think not only what has been achieved over the years, but also in terms of carving out uh, the uh, program of research, interesting program of research uh, for the years ahead. Uh, um, uh, and, um, and in the program for today, uh, we will also be introducing a number of uh, distinguished uh, you know, persons who will be commenting uh, on what Doug has said, but also sharing with us a little bit about their own work. So it will be um, um, a very, uh, should be a very interactive session. But because of the way the virtual environment operates, I would like to ask you to uh, post uh, your comments in the chat. In the meantime, while we are getting presentations from DAC and the distinguished group of, um, uh, of uh, panelists. And then at the end, I will open uh, the discussion to the floor. Uh, where you will be free to give your interventions, questions, comments, suggestions, you know, uh, going ahead. 
Uh, the session is recorded just for the master so that uh, we can share it widely. And for housekeeping, may I ask you please to mute yeah, your microphone so that we don't have a lot of uh, interfering background knowledge uh, noise. And also, um, maybe uh, if the video interferes with this one, you can just uh, mute that depending on, um, on the conditions of your connectivity. With that, a uh, duck, uh, congratulations once again. You are most welcome. Please go ahead and share us your ideas about development finance institutions. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Victor. And I'm absolutely um, delighted and, uh, and thrilled to have been appointed Professor of Practice um, at the Soros University of London and um, in your Centre for Global Finance um, that, you, that you direct. And um, I think we go um, uh, back quite a long time, so two decades ago, I think we, um, we were writing uh, chapters in, um, in books together, uh, together uh, uh, about FDI and, and financial capital market, uh, financial uh, or capital markets, and um, uh, and over time we have interacted a lot uh, about uh, research on the global financial crisis. Um, remember in Kenya uh, that we did a lot of work, and also um, and of course I've, I've followed your um, your research program in in in, in great detail um, uh, around the um, sort of financial markets in uh, in Africa, and I've got huge admiration um, both for uh, of course, your um, your your the output, the, the journal articles, uh, research that has been provided, but also for the, the excellent networks that you um, that you have uh, uh, brought to it, uh, and and of course are uh, are maintaining. Let me also uh, express my gratitude to SOAS more generally. Um, my, my my day job is uh, is I'm at uh, ODI. I'm a director for international economic development, and um, but half to three quarters of the team and about 10, 15 people. Um, uh, have had um, over time uh, had a, a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD from SOAS, and so there's a lot of interaction between sort of SOAS and uh, and ODI, and so and a lot of interaction and also um, uh, sort of more widely about SOAS. So let me um, uh, begin uh, sort of the uh, the lecture, and also thank you very much for for assembling um, uh, such a um, um, uh, uh, distinguished uh, set of people. Okay. Um, let me go to the first slide, and I hope you can all see it. Um, and so I'll be talking about development finance institutions in Africa, shaping future research uh, directions. Um, now it's going to be a, a PowerPoint about 20, 25 minutes. So there's going to be a lot on it, um, and it's going to be circulated later. So if you miss a few, a few things, uh, don't don't worry. Um, so the, the, the task that um, uh, that I've set myself um, for this uh, this 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 this, uh, this sort of uh, inaugural lecture is to um, shape uh, a research agenda on development finance institutions in Africa, um, and an agenda which is both informed by and inspires practice. And so I'd like to sort of build on my own practical experience on development finance institutions. And uh, um, uh, I've, I've done have some practical experience of it, as, as Victor already mentioned. So I've advised a range of bodies and, um, and, and ministers um, around um, around DFIs uh, over the last sort of 15, uh, 15 years uh, of work and also work on economic transformation. Uh, and I've had a chance to work with African leaders and also um, fantastic African researchers as well. And of course, I like to bring these two strands also together. And, and so the, the key message, uh, I think, um, up front that I'd like to sort of um, highlight is that um, I think that there are the expectations from and the actions by development finance institutions are changing. They have been changing over the last decade, two decades, and they've been turned they turn from sort of mere investors, um, uh, thinking about investment project project, into major development players. Um, and uh, and I think this the research agenda needs to both reflect this um, and so assess whether it has worked, um, but also the research agenda should inform these changes further. So what, what is the future for development finance institutions? Um, good. Oops. Then. Um, so uh, let me just briefly talk a bit about sort of uh, definitions and focus and instruments and sectors of DFIs. So development finance institutions are um, institutions, then they can be international and national in nature, regional, um, and they can provide finance uh, for the public sector, the private sector, uh, and uh, sometimes it, they do both. 
um, and um, but we're of course talking about those um, DFIs that operate in in Africa. Uh, there are lots. Um, so there, are, uh, one publication counts that there are about 110 uh, uh, development banks, um, national and regional uh, development banks, and uh, so there's some major ones and some very tiny, uh, tiny ones as well. Um, now in this lecture, uh, I'd like to focus on international development finance institutions, um, not necessarily, necessarily domestic or national development banks, which I think is also really important, um, and those that, that that aim to provide finance to the private sector. In Africa, so particularly uh, focusing on European development finance institutions, the EIB, European Investment Bank, uh, which is perhaps more on the uh, particular the private sector side, and um, the IFC uh, in terms of finance corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. Uh, but of course, it has wider implications, I would argue, as well uh, for 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 other DFIs as well. The distinction feature of development finance institutions, in my view, is that they provide targeted finance and they are complementary to capital markets so firms in in in, in african countries can can raise capital from from uh, from the capital markets from stock markets and so on but there is also complementary to that there are funds that can be put in place and these funds um uh, that uh, can um that can invest um do so and hope to sort of address market failures in capital markets so the capital markets themselves uh, fail to allocate resources, for example, to um, often to long term finance, such as infrastructure or, or climate finance. And you need dedicated funds for this DFIs um, supported by by governments. Um, these international DFIs provides uh, as, uh, private sector uh, with finance in the form of loans often. So that's usually more than half in the, in, in the portfolios, followed by equity that's a bit less than half and a tiny percentage goes to guarantees. They provide finance to the financial sector, um, so funds, uh, intermediate funds, um, and um, uh, so about a third, about a third of their their investment goes to infrastructure, both transport and energy infrastructure, and then there's other sectors as well. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you look at, uh, at some of the data, and that is almost like a research project on its own, or a, a PhD or a professorship on its own, looking at the data of, of the advice is not an easy, an easy task, as uh, as many uh, in this research community will uh, will recognise. Um, but you can start of sort of bringing some data together, um, uh, and maybe sometimes it's a bit of apples and pears. But if you if you look at the ATFIS, the European Development Finance Institutions, the IFC, the EIB, and if you bring that together and you compare, for example, 2005 2021, then you find that the the annual investment um, um, it has uh, has increased fivefold between 2005 to 2021. And that has increased much faster than, for example, foreign direct investment, so the private investment that has gone into Africa, which, which has also increased uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, about twofold over that period. And DFI finance uh, of the, the DFI that I mentioned have, have risen faster than a total gross fixed capital formation um, in, in, um, in, in Africa. And sort of combined, that's, uh, um, the DFIs that I mentioned are now worth about 2% of, uh, of the investment. Um, they're also uh, quite sizable players now in terms of GDP, so the total income. So they have become bigger players over time. And, and I would argue they're big players that should have a macro impact now as well. Oops. Um, now, then the um, shareholders, uh, and they're mostly uh, individual governments or, or a range of governments uh, for, the, for the international DFIs, but can also be, um, be, be banks and so on. Uh, they can also be shareholders, for example, in the FMO in the Netherlands. They set, um, uh, the shareholders set multiple objectives to, um, to DFIs, and, um, and there are at least four. And some of them are complementary and some may be conflicting. And so DFIs need to be additional to the market. Uh, the market itself, if it can do, it can, it can provide finance to the private sector, then you don't need to intervene, right? Um, but the, the DFIs also like, to, uh, like the, um, or the shareholders also like the DFIs to mobilize additional private capital. And um, so that they leverage in new private sector uh, finance. Um, and those two sometimes uh, go hand in hand, but sometimes they're not the same. Because if you, if you, for example, think about a global financial crisis, then capital is, is, is withdrawing from countries. Um, then it's very easy for a DFI to be additional to the market because private sector withdraws. But um, because the uh, uh, private sector is withdrawing, it's very difficult to mobilize additional capital. So you already have a sort of a bit of a conflict there. 
shareholders also want DFIs to have um, to to sort of be uh, not lose money because um, if you invest and you don't get your money back, then at some point um, you can't invest anymore. So you want to have sort of like a revolving fund. So you need to finance on commercial terms. You don't want to be loss making. But at the same time, you also want DFIs to have a major development impact. So you want to have them uh, impact on the sustainable development goals. And, and it, of course, within them, there are already uh, different um, different objectives. Um, but if you think a bit about that, that, that sometimes um, investment in a, in a profitable enterprise, or often, um, will will create a lot of development impact. Um, um, and without uh, having profits, making profits, uh, investment would not be sustainable. Um, and in the longer term, that would not be, create jobs, right? So you wouldn't have any impacts. Um, but uh, amongst the profitable uh, projects, some have a bigger impact on development than others. So it's not always sometimes compromise, but conflicting. Um, in terms of um, um, sort of all the uh, development over time, um, I would argue that that uh, these international DFIs have developed in a major way uh, over, um, over time, but perhaps not not sufficiently. Um, I, when I started work, looking at into DFIs in 2000, when I joined the Overseas Development Institute (ODI), the, the, most of the DFIs were, were obscure. Um, they, I didn't know um, uh, much about them, and the development community more, more widely didn't know much about the CDCs, the IFCs um, uh, of this world at, 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 at that time. Um, and but they have grown um, uh, into um, much bigger players. And they've been drafted into all sorts of policy statements, such as the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, uh, to finance sustainable development goals. And uh, uh, and these days, there's lots of discussion about blended finance, and of course, DFIs play an important role. The research community has done some catch up, but initially didn't do much uh, much work apart from micro level monitoring. And it's and, and of course, over time, the last decades, it has gone f quite far into harmonising impact standards and uh, uh, additional uh, research has. Um, um, has come to um, uh, to light, um, and uh, if we, for example, take the impact on jobs measurement, um, that has has developed over time. Um, initially, in the year two thousand, I remember uh, being in seminars and the shareholders they would stand up and say, "We provide finance uh, through DFIs into poorer countries, into Africa, um, and because we provide capital, that's got to be good for development. That's got to be good for jobs." Um, so it was assumed. Um, of course, then uh, we wanted to have a bit more accountability and, and initial and anecdotal evidence came up um, so sort of that, uh, that 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 device did have an impact. And then over time uh, in the FMO and the IFC, um, you had the bean counters, well, bean counters, perhaps sort of the, the monitors who, who say, well, actually, how many jobs are being uh, supported in the companies that we invest in? Um, uh, how many how many taxes do they pay? Uh, how much carbon dioxide uh, emissions are, are prevented by them? Um, this was just in their investee companies, but of course, if you if you invest, that it doesn't only help that particular sector, but it also helps other sectors. Um, and you can use input output models for that. That's a Soviet plan idea that came into uh, uh, into uh, emergent in the 60s, and that became um, has now become into use by many DFIs actually um, to sort of understand what is the job impact. And then there are a range of other uh, act techniques that have come into place. Um, uh, artful estimator, the economic magicians, the, doing the sort of the very detailed randomized control trials or uh, or micro level economic econometrics. Um, and then you had the systems uh, thinkers, uh, the macro uh, the macro effects, and and then there are the people who say it all depends. The, the proper economists, right? They, they say, well, the, it depends on the context. Um, and uh, and actually, that's going to be a major point in my in my lecture as well. That actually they need to think about the context, the the, the African policy context. Um, and um, uh, if we go to the next slide, there is a. Um, um, then thinking about and um, the impact of FDI of DFIs in Africa, uh, it's really important to do this. There's a huge um, uh, uh, financing gap um, uh, estimated by some, uh, and I think I saw this. I think blog by Nimrod Salk, who I think is also online, is saying that there is a, a financing gap of about two hundred billion dollars uh, a year annually to to um, uh, to reach the SDGs. And there's lots of different types of capital are needed for FDI, um, uh, domestic capital, but also DFI, international DFI. And we need to understand the impact that that that, that those DFIs have, both for steering DFIs into particular areas, but also for monitoring what they're doing and for evaluating uh, afterwards, so for accountability on what they have done. Um, and it's pretty hard to sort of say, well, take these objectives that I mentioned, the the, the unicorn objectives that were there. Um, 
is uh, is to sort of assess each individual objective. Um, but you could perhaps uh, bring evidence together, and maybe we haven't done that enough. And that's sort of so. I think those are one of the or two things that are missing from the literature on the impact of DFIs is actually bring it all together, bring all these 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 individual assessment techniques together, and say what uh, what together do they actually say about investment by DFIs in say Uganda, for example. Um, and secondly, what is missing um, is that we don't really um, these assessment techniques don't really take into account the policy environment within which these investments take place. So um, uh, the, the input output models um, are uh, don't say um, well you have bigger impact if the policy context is uh, is, is is better than if the, if the policy context isn't that good. And that has been unlike other types of literatures that look at the impact of international financial flows as well. So. Um, and this is something that that I worked on uh, uh, about a decade ago when we were advising um, the Secretary of State on, on CDC reform at that stage. Um, um, is um, is is that you 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 can look at the impact of foreign direct investment, the impact of aid going into other countries, and the impact of DFIs, um, sort of loans and equity. And um, there are different types of studies have been undertaken for different types of flows. Um, and for FDI and aid, there are a lot of macro studies and also studies that that talk about um, the policy environment within which these 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 investments take place. Not so for DFIs, and that's a gap. So particularly the yellow uh, box um, is a gap. I did also identified a gap in red, the red box um, for the macro studies, but that is being developed now in the last decade a bit more. Um, so. Um, uh, so if we think about uh, what I mentioned earlier about bringing these assessment techniques together, one way to do that is to sort of to argue that um, that these, these, these assessment, assessment techniques have different objectives and they all have their both positive aspects and their more challenging and negative aspects. So they can do certain things, but they can't do others. And if we then go th down to the positive column, so the third column, um, then there are quite a lot of positive aspects of these techniques, so things that they can do. Uh, so if you think about uh, interviews with companies, they can provide you with narratives of how an investment may have a catalyzing impact. Um, if you look at, um, at the annual reports of DFIs, they look at the, the annual reports of their investee companies, where you get a good picture of what these, these um, uh, if you harmonize your standards, uh, harmonize your, your impact standards, that, that uh, you get a good picture of, of what's being supported inside the DFIs, but of course Petty will later say that it may, it may also be difficult there. Um, and then if you have some of the macroeconometric studies, uh, and input output models, they, they provide may perhaps more better estimates of the indirect effects. And bringing this all together, um, you can then um, um, uh, get a bigger, a better picture. So if we do that, um, I, I sometimes say, I think that you can get a quite a positive uh, story. Um, 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 but it perhaps needs to be done more in a targeted way. So that's perhaps one element in, in a in a research agenda. Um, so uh, there are these anecdotal types of evidence that basically say that the chairman of, of Celtel or MTN, uh, a big telecommunication company now, of course, um, but but in, in the early 2000s wasn't. They got this this anchor investment from CDC, and we, uh, that has catalyzed much more investment. And and now look at what, how big these telecommunications have become. Um, there are fantastic statistics in DFI annual reports. Uh, at the finest companies employed 2.6 million employees, and through these input output models um, that, that, um, that, that are now being used by DFIs, you can calculate it, that these, these these create 8.6 million indirect, indirect jobs. Um, and there are a range of other uh, things that uh, that you can do. You can look at individual investments. Um, we, we looked at Uganda Bugoya hydropower plant, and I wrote sort of in terms of reference uh, for a study, uh, and which was. Which basically showed that that yes, you could create jobs directly in the operation of a hydropower plant, but indirectly you create uh, you create a lot, a lot more jobs uh, through the productivity effects that that investment has. So the multipliers, but also the indirect effects, and um, uh, and there are, you can also use macroeconomic regressions. And we've done uh, some of those studies there that suggest that um, that DFIs um, can um, uh, have uh, have a macroeconomic impact. And if you compare it to the to the literature on aid, um, the impacts are about the same, but certainly not less. So we estimated that a 10 billion increase uh, euro increase in in investment in Africa would raise productivity and incomes by about a quarter of a percent. Um, and these 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 estimates can be used sometimes in the policy debate. Um, uh, 
you can look at uh, data intelligently, you can look at it before, after, you can sort of see when the DFI investment goes up, you can see whether the gross fixed capital formation uh, also goes up. So look at it in an intelligent way. Then, of course, that doesn't take into account other factors. So you need to have macro uh, or micro econometric studies uh, uh, to, to account for multiple factors, um, which I've discussed previously. And these types of the, um, uh, these these estimates um, can sometimes feed, uh, 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 get themselves into the uh, into the to the debate. Um, and so these these estimates that are suggested on the on the, the macro level, for example, um, were used um, uh, by the Secretary of State in Parliament uh, to also justify a um, a capital increment uh, for for uh, CDC uh, at that time. Um, and uh, and so there are some other outlets that 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 uh, that that use that, um, and I think there are some positive sides to to that. Um, but of course, the macroeconomic regression doesn't tell the whole story, and I think we need to develop the literature further. And that's going to be the last few slides of my presentation. On my argument is that um, that DFIs um, uh, aren't operating um, and shouldn't be operating uh, as isolated actors. Um, and they are whole, uh, they're amongst a whole range of actors um, uh, in a system of local international support organizations. Um, that said, of course, DFIs themselves have grown in size and they are increasingly seen as part of the solution to global challenges, not just like a, a, a investing in individual firms here or there in, in some countries, but actually the, the shareholders want them to solve global challenges like climate change, jobs crisis, macroeconomic crisis, the health crisis now. Um, and um, uh, and to some extent, the DFIs are changing. Um, uh, Neil Gregory, hopefully, will talk a bit more about IFC 3.0 and the market creation and that they, that, the upstream work that, they, that they're doing. Um, CDC, um, when when I started looking at that um, in the early 2000s, it had almost been privatized then. It um, it had only had 25 employees. Now it's got about, I think Betty may, um, may correct me, but about three, between three and 500 uh, employees. And it's a very, di very different CDC. Um, well, Steve Weiss are doing a lot of work on screening investment and thinking about where to invest, and they do also a lot of work on monitoring performance um, after the financial closure and, and also an impact. They do perhaps, they pay much less systematic attention to understanding, supporting and influencing the local policy context during the project cycle. Uh, and that is, I think, despite the fact that, um, that evidence suggests in the economic literature that, that economic progress depends on policy and institutional context around an investment. Uh, some countries can use uh, uh, any type of investment really well because they've got put a good policy context. Other countries won't be able to do that. It will remain an enclave investment and it won't, there won't not, will not be spillovers. And I think my, my feeling is that 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 debate has been lacking from the literature on the impact of uh, DFIs, unlike uh, the debate on the role of policy in FDI. And I've done a lot of work also in my PhD was on the impact of foreign direct investment. Um, and um, and 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 uh, and so we we talk uh, we we provide three examples here of where I think the literature on DFIs could be extended. Um, so first of all, um, the, it's really important to um, to highlight the impact of um, uh, of uh, going to the next yeah um, of productivity spillovers. So what is really important to um, um, uh, to realize is that um, the impact. Uh, the wider impacts of the device isn't just the jobs that they create or support in, an, in, the, in, in their investee companies. It's also what happens in the wider economy. Uh, it's when their investment have uh, uh, productivity spillovers to the local firms that, that perhaps supply them. Um, and, uh, and so all, literal FDI su suggests that, a, um, um, that if you increase foreign ownership in a particular sector, uh, then the local firms will gain from that. Uh, there will be uh, uh, productivity spillover because of the technology transfer that might take place. Um, but those those spillovers are not automatic or direct. Um, and um, and it all depends uh, on the context. Um, that's where it all depends uh, comes comes back. It depends on which sector um, the, the DFI or the, or the foreign investor is located in. It depends on the, the, the extent to which there are local linkages to the to the local um, local economy. It depends uh, uh, to, to the extent to which there is financial development um, uh, in the in the country, whether there is trading and labor mobility between the firms that are that you invest in and the local firms, and whether there is technological uh, and innovation cap capabilities in the local firms that are supplying perhaps these these bigger firms. And there are firm specific other issues that, that play a role. 
Now, this this literature can be um, can be uh, taken from the DFI uh, from the FDI context and trans transformed into the DFI uh, literature. And DFIs aren't necessarily uh, couldn't should, wouldn't be necessarily uh, neutral players. Um, they could also influence these um, these these channels. And working with other organizations, other other uh, organizations, they can also uh, influence those channels. They can help build local linkages with support from from uh, from aid and other uh, and other factors. And supporting the actions of African leaders, African governments, uh, and recognizing that there are many different approaches in the different countries. And so I've uh, so visited a range of countries um, around economic transformation, and you can say that. For example, the mega investments uh, in Mozambique um, uh, on the left hand side were met with a lot of uh, policy action um, uh, from the government side. Whereas if you go on the right hand side, uh, the Tanzania and Ethiopia, um, you get a bit more dirigist and more active approaches uh, uh, towards um, towards the investment. And so DFIs can can go with the grain. They can work with the policy environment. Um, and not only invest, but also work with other organizations uh, and, and, and local policy actors to, to make that investment work for development um, as well. Um, and um, another example, the second example I'd like to say, to mention is, uh, is something that I've um, highlighted in a previous lecture, um, um, uh, with, uh, with, which I've done with my colleagues, uh, Sharon Raga and Phyllis Papa David. Um, and I presented a, a, at a seminar, um, Victor, which is the argument I made was that the impact of FDI on development, for example, on human capital formation, um, is positive, particularly about um, um, about uh, tertiary and secondary education um, uh, enrollment rates. But the impact is much stronger if you already have um, a high endowment of, of skills to work with. Um, and that is also likely to be the case for DFIs. So if your, your investment for DFIs work, uh, work better, um, uh, have bigger impact, if you can coordinate your actions um, with uh, a, 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 an economic structure that has high skills, technology, um, and, you, and, and, and there can be coordination that can be taking place. Um, and you can then upgrade the the, um, the operations of of your investment investee company. Uh, you can work more with the local economy if there is more skills available, uh, and that can overall lead to high competitiveness and more development over time. Um, and that is actually a bigger point that coordination of actors is a very big point. We looked at ODI um, uh, at um, uh, at how economic transformation happens, uh, and and actually a lot happens at the sector level through coordination. Of actors, um, not just by isolated uh, investment or isolated uh, policy actions, it's by bringing uh, finance and policy together, and um, and it's of course you need to identify your investment really well, and DFIs are extremely good at that. Um, that's point one: correct identification of economic opportunities. They they look where the private sector goes, and that, that, that's fantastic. But you have factors two and six, uh, two to six as well, and ex actually. Um, uh, whether that investment works or not, whether that sector transforms uh, into a successful sector, uh, actually is all dependent on the political economy, and it all depends on the the the, the, the action that that takes place around this. Um, and if the political economy isn't right, that sector may not develop well, and the potential won't be realised. If the political economy is working, um, then um, then that sector will will be a, a stepping stone towards further national economic transformation, and so that depends uh, a, a coordination of actors of of of, um, um, of of actors. That coordination problem needs to be um, needs to be um, addressed. And so the question is sort of how do DFIs actually fit into this system? How can they collaborate with others to overcome the challenges? So they, they may make an investment and then they say, well, actually, the profitability of my investment is dependent on other factors. And so how do they then, um, uh, what do they then do? Are they then passive players or could it be more active players to, to achieve certain development ob objectives? Um, and, and to some extent, that is that is that is now um, that, that, that is working now. So in some DFIs are doing that, and in particular, we looked at uh, some greater detail um, uh, the impact on uh, or, or, or on on uh, the IFC and the, the wider uh, the wider World Bank group. And so 
Um, and but it also plays a role between the European Commission aid and the EIB, um, SCDO grants and CDC um, uh, uh, or should be BII finance. So you've got the traditional aid grant providers and you've got the DFIs. And so the DFIs need to depend need, uh, need to depend on private sector demand for for their finance. Um, so they need to work to some extent opportunistically. Whereas the traditional aid grant providers are more the create the, the strategic and uh, creative uh, planners. Uh, they think about planning uh, an economy uh, and uh, uh, providing public goods with a long time horizon. And so you need to bring these two mindsets together and you can undertake joint diagnostics and sort of think about where there are the binding constraints and then perhaps uh, make commitments. For example, IC can make commitments and you can draw in technical assistance around that to sort of help with uh, making that investment work. Uh, as well. And there are some of these approaches that are being undertaken, um, cascade approach, financing for development. And actually, uh, we, we, we could be doing much more to sort of, uh, as a research community, to analyze sort of what works in this context. How can you bring um, this together? And there's also a use of country platforms. Um, um, and uh, we've undertaken a study with the Stockholm Environment Institute um, that hopefully will be launched in the coming months um, uh, with, a co with a colleague, uh, so Samantha Attridge, um, um, uh, uh, and, and others. Um, to sort of um, sort of how can DFIs link to the national development plans and uh, one way to do is through country platforms that are being piloted and Paul Collier was uh, was highly influential on that as well I think and sort of IC and CDC have been working I think together uh, around sort of providing technical advice upstream but also thinking about a role for, for DFIs later on for example in Ethiopian telecoms. Okay that leads me to the final slide um, uh, Victor. Um, and uh, and I realize that, of course, there's a lot in on the slides uh, and I hope you, you get a chance to sort of um, uh, read, it, read it afterwards um, as well. Um, and uh, and of course, um, what I've been highlighting isn't um, uh, something that, uh, that that I can do on my own. Uh, it is actually the, the idea that we have a whole research community around this that 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 inter interacts with DFIs, um, uh, with with academia, with uh, think tanks. Uh, and also um, sort of uh, working with uh, with um, with shareholders um, as well. So there is a, um, a demand for DFIs to achieve objectives um, such as, for example, sector transformation. And uh, and so the question really becomes what could be the role, the strategic role of a DFI in sector transformation? And so there is an, a, a huge important policy agenda there um, at, in Africa. There's an AU2063 transformation agenda. One of the policy tools is the content of free trade area that I'm working on at the, a lot of, at the moment. Um, and it's hoping that um, that sector transformation can can lead, really transform the African continent, which can then lead to job creation and development gains um, in a sustained way. Um, but what is then the role for DFIs in all of this? Um, um, what is the, their, their competitive advantage? Um, uh, what is their role? Uh, and so we need to understand that better um, uh, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, that, they, that uh, in, in terms of literature that suggests that action on your own um, may or may not have the desired impact you dependent on, on the complementary policies. What is the link to industrial policy there? Second point, what are the DFIs in, as policy actors during the project cycle? I've seen a lot of work um, that DFIs are undertaking about the initial investment. Which investment should they take? I, I see much less of uh, um, explicitly of what DFIs are doing um, when that investment is taking place during the project cycle. And so shouldn't there be sort of um, a, a department for strategic interventions or strategic uh, relationships in these DFIs and, and what type of action would, would, would help, uh, what would be most effective? Um, thirdly, I think a very important agenda still remains mobilization of capital. I haven't uh, talked much about that, um, uh, but of course the sort of the blended finance uh, literature that basically the, the, the premise there is that um, is that um, there are different types of capital. There's lots of capital spinning around uh, um, in in in, uh, uh, in in the city of London elsewhere. Um, and the, how do you draw that capital down to where you want it to go? Um, and uh, and so how do you mobilize that capital, or perhaps better, how do you direct that capital towards, for example, climate action? Um, and and there are huge opportunities also in the African continent. Um, I did a paper with Carlos Lopez um, in, uh, last year. That's, that also suggests that Africa can now finally industrialize um, 
in a way that is um, th that can use renewable energy. Other continents haven't been able to do that. But of course, uh, the question is how, what combination of policies and finance can best support that, um, that transition. I think there are a couple of other agendas that, that I may not have touched on enough, but what, that, that we will still come back to is about the counter-cyclical role. Um, um, I've touched on that about a decade ago and during the global financial crisis. We looked at that also in the, during the COVID crisis is when other capitals withdrawn can DFIs become more counter-cyclical and how can they be even more counter-cyclical and engineer a more inclusive and productive and sustainable recovery. And Stanford Griffith Jones has done a little work on that. I don't know whether she's online at the moment, but I think that's really important to, to highlight as well. And which may be to some an elephant in the room, um, but to others, I think is also just part of the uh, part of the um, uh, uh, the the research agenda uh, going forward is is that these international DFIs that I've talked about are um, are are operating in a, in a wider context in which um, uh, there are other financiers, of course, um, as well, uh, and um, including the private sector, um, and there, there's in, uh, uh, so bonds, uh, sovereign bonds. Um, are happening a lot. A lot of public debt is also increasing in 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 African countries now, also due to COVID. But also, uh, uh, there have been Chinese financiers as well, and I think we need to um, understand that much better as well. Okay, the conclusions. Um, international DFIs have become more important over time, um, particularly the the one, those that are invested in the private sector. Uh, of course, also the African Development Bank. Uh, the African Bank is playing a much bigger role now. And their expected roles that they play in the, in in sustainable development um, are changing, and so uh, that is something that we need to reflect. We need to think more on, um, partly because we haven't really sort of identified what changing role um, works best. Um, how can they can the advice best link with technical system providers? What what policy roles could they have? Um, and partly because we need to sort of perhaps help the advisor along and sort of say this, these are um, what the literature tells us are important interventions for them to take. Um, and so um, we're hoping that uh, that we can advance this research agenda and there are lots of other uh, other elements that need to be uh, need to be looked at um, in the in the uh, in the years ahead. Um, I would say that whilst we looked at um, the sort of international DFIs for the private sector, I think this is more generally an important area for, for all DFIs. So rich research agenda, uh, I can't do it on my own uh, by all means. I'd like to sort of um, to contribute to this uh, as I've been doing from a practical uh, experience um, and also like to sort of bring um, sort of academic uh, w w uh, expertise in this and link it more, more widely to the policy perspectives and I'm really looking forward to sort of what the, uh, the representatives uh, from the African Development Bank, from the African research community and also from the DFIs that I've talked about a lot have to say and uh, and what they think are the important uh, issues that um, that need to be looked at and so that we jointly can think forward and of course there are a, a very range of networks that, um, that, that, that we're all Part of there's a private sector development research uh, a network that that I see and other DFIs are uh, are leading. There is a, a network of European development finance institutions that that hold an annual conference with ODI every year, um, and there are a whole range of other networks that I think we need to join up uh, together with SOAS, and I'd um, and, and and I'd like to really contribute to that. So over to you, Victor, to chairing this um, this um, uh, this the rest of the session. I'm looking forward to the comments, and I'm also hoping to sort of contribute to the chat. Uh, Get the questions in the chat um, and of course to liaise with all of you uh, students um, um, uh, but also uh, uh, professional officials um, 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 everywhere uh, in the UK uh, but more globally and of course in particularly in the in, in, the, in the poorer countries but in, in Africa um, and elsewhere. Thank you very much uh, uh, Victor, uh, uh, over to you. Uh, thank uh, you thank indeed you. Doc, uh, let uh, me uh, give you a hand of applause uh, for a very brilliant um, um, in all your lecture, um, uh, extraordinarily brilliant because it touches on all the dimensions of uh, a research ecosystem uh, supporting FDIs. So you have the researchers and the econometric work you've been uh, uh, um, um, uh, showing here, sharing with us. You also have this is um, the research on the on the demand on the on the supply side of the research, producing the research. You have also touched on the uh, policymakers, private sector, 
a, um, um, all the, uh, you know, a demand, if they demand the research that's supplied by researchers, and then the role of the think tanks like ODI, the intermediaries. So that's, you know, um, um, absolutely brilliant. Um, now, we'd like to move to uh, the second component uh, of this uh, program. Uh, we would like to uh, get some reflections from um, uh, African development banks uh, and uh, researchers in Africa. Uh, um, you know, the bankers uh, uh, on the demand side and the researchers on the supply side. And uh, I'll call upon uh, our three um, uh, persons. I'll call upon uh, um, uh, Dr. Andrew Maba, uh, who is uh, has until recently been uh, the country manager and uh, the resident representative of the African Development Bank uh, in Malawi. Um, a, a Andrew has a PhD in economics from the University of Manchester. Also, quite upon a, a Grace Chokunda, who is a private sector specialist with the African Development Bank and regional office in Nairobi, and she will be speaking in a, in a personal capacity because she has had long experience of working with the private sector, uh, both at the FDB, but also at the World Bank and previously with the national governments in Africa. And then, sadly, I'll call upon a professor, Joshua Abo, who is uh, a distinguished professor of finance and development at the University of Ghana, Legon, and has uh, over so many years prolifically contributed this debate. And I'll give each one of them uh, just only about five minutes so that they can share with us some reflections on the inaugural lecture by Doug. So uh, let me call in, in that order, Andrew, Grace, and Georgia. So Andrew, please go ahead. Thank you, Victor, for this uh, invitation. And you know, let me also thank Jack for the this very interesting presentation and the very insightful. Yeah, as you said, uh, you know, I, uh, my background is working at ADB uh, for many years. So I think when I speak, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will have that intonation. I'm happy that I'm speaking before Grace. Yeah, otherwise, I wonder anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, just as as a background as well, you know, as 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 Dick has mentioned, you know, there have been many DFIs which are which have been established since, since the DFIs, since the uh, the World Bank in 1945. Uh, many more have been set up. The the, the Asian uh, banks also also came up, like the JDB, KDB. Um, but you know, in Africa alone, we have more than 100 DFIs with the, the ADB at the apex. But uh, you know, there, there is still a lot of appetite for these type of institutions. As you can see, like in, in recent years, the, we had the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank set up, and also the BRICS have set up the new development bank. So there's something that uh, the DFIs were doing right, and that's why you know this model is being pursued further and further. The, 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 the roles have been uh, already, you know, well, well, well articulated, but uh, just to, to recap, uh, GFIs like our own in the, the, the ADB have been able to provide um, financing to entities, including governments, business, and, and other organizations. You know, this financing is mainly in loans, grants, and guarantees. But you know, the, the, the difference with DFIs is that uh, they, they are lending featured a high grant component uh, as compared to borrowing from financial markets or private institutions. So that, that's, that, that, that was a plus for them. So the um, financing for capacity building has also been at the center of DFI's uh, activities. They have also become uh, centers of excellence for development practice, knowledge sharing, and also capacity development. Victor is, is, is familiar with that. He played a role in that, you know, that ADB. So the, let, let me go straight to, to what worked, you know, as, as we see it, you know, from a perspective of, a, um, of somebody who was involved with the DFIs and also working in the field. Uh, I think for us, the, the DFIs were very instrumental in generating long-term capital for investment, especially in infrastructure and public, public goods. Because these are big ticket items which can be financed by, by governments. But more importantly, the DFIs are the a multiplier effect, you know, crowding in funds from capital markets, member countries' contributions, and also concessional financing, especially after the 
the capitals opened up to the non-regionals in 1982. We saw much more of this. So we have um, at, at, at AGB, we have ADF and then IDA at, at World Bank. These are constitutional windows, which, which are brought in, you know, with the, the crowding by, by GFI. And, and also GFI is operator on, on a large scale, on, on, a, on, a, on, on a global scale. And they have a diversified range of sectors. This model is superior to many forms of, of, um, of assistance, where they're able to share uh, experiences ac across the, the globe. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, GFI financing was effective compared to autonomous financing because it comes with technical support and capacity building. Most of the projects which, which are financed come with a, a lot of technical support from the, from, from the banks. AGF did a lot of this. Including supporting support at the at, at the project cycle itself, and and, and also GFIs because of their knowledge have been able to enforce quality in design, procurement, and implementation of the projects, and you know sharing best practices across countries. There's also another thing which I would say here is that you know financing financing development, you know, is also it has all its benefits because you know the, the the borrower has a discipline to to to, to deploy the funds responsibly because there is the, the obligation to pay. So financing has also been able to to drive that kind of responsibility from uh, from the beneficiaries. G, G, uh, GF has also used the financing to drive policy and sector reforms in in, in countries, which which is also quite helpful. Now, what are the what are what what are the needs? I I, I thought for, for for my comments uh, on the Dex paper, I'll, I'll focus more on infrastructure, and you know what needs to be done, especially from the private private sector side. You know, the, as you know, the biggest needs in, in, for Africa is in financing infrastructure to close to close gaps in the transport, energy, water, and also you know facilitating uh, cross-border trade and in the industrialization. So these are the, the things which I, which I think are, are, are very important. Now, AFDB recently put an estimate of uh, infrastructure financing gaps alone of more than $100 million per year. These, these, these are the gaps that, 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 that the, the countries face. And, and as you know, from national budgets and even GFI contributions, we cannot meet that type of gap. You know, we 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 face a big issue, especially when financing regional projects. I, I remember I was involved with preparing the, the the strategy for Southern Africa. One of the things that we were grappling with was that you know where do we get the the, the funds for the big projects? Like like the we kept talking about the, the the African Expressway from Cape to Cairo. How do you finance that? You know, can governments put in? You know, governments also at at a different levels of, of, of development. You find that in, in South Africa, the road is complete, but what do we do in Zambia, Tanzania? So, so the the, the, the issue of financing regional projects is it's very 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 key. Um, so the we see that you know the, the the private sector finance is evolving, you know, especially through BOT operations and other concessions. To support this type of uh, infrastructure expenditure, so uh, the public, public, uh, public partnerships also offer an additional approach to increase private sector investment in in, in, in infrastructure, and also they they, they, they ensure PP, PPPs also ensure a high level of efficiency in the development and, and operation of, of infrastructures. So the, the 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 financing options, you know, um, as, as outlined. So what 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 should we do now to to enhance this? What what, what is the unfinished business? You see, the GFI is uh, uh, increasingly becoming becoming a, a play, playing catalytic role, you know, creating partnerships to bring in the the, the, the funding which which is which is required by African countries. So the, the, we, we have to have increased use of um, convening power syndication to, to mobilize funds from the private sector for large scale investments, uh, as I mentioned. But more importantly also, the, the DFIs should try to offload some of the expertise which they have in, 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 in treasury departments, 
private sector departments onto the countries so that you know we can increase their, their capacity to interact with the capital markets. In other words, let's let's teach them to fish. You know, we have been fishing for them for a long time. That's one role that uh, GFRs can play. Um, the other um, way to do this is to build the country's capacity to mobilize resources through innovative, innovative financing and crowdfunding schemes, including stock markets. These are these are the, the you know sources which can, which can also be developed. The the important thing also for GFIs is to provide advisory services to countries to structure large investments, especially in PPPs and also ensuring skills transfer. You know, recently the AFDB president, uh, Adesina, uh, after visiting uh, Senegal, announced the, the launch of the PPP framework in, in, in the bank, which, which he says will run for, another, for about 10 years. I think this is, a, this is a, a, a concrete step that the bank is taking to, to support uh, PPP financing, especially for, for infrastructures. So the, 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 the banks also uh, should, not, should, not, should not stop advising. They should also take up invest, investor positions, especially in, 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 large, in, in large projects. In this way, they, they, they're able to, to, to de-risk investments and crowd in the private sector. In, in, in that way, we are, you know, we are, we are growing more, more resources. So, so, so basically, this is a, what I was going to say. But then, uh, what, what are the, what, what are the, what, what are the, what are the sources? Where, 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 where would the funding come from? You know, uh, we have in African countries a lot of assets held by pension funds, insurance funds, and and and, and other other saving uh, schemes. In 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 the SADC alone, we 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 estimated that. Uh, you know, the up to five hundred billion dollars could be raised, you know, for, from this type of schemes if if they are well governed. We also have uh, the issue of um, mobilizing remittances to developing countries. I mean, to African countries by expanding the use of diaspora bonds. For Africa, these products could raise up to ten billion dollars per annum. This is what what has been stated by, by McKinsey. Um, the we also have to increase the use of guarantees to stimulate private sector capital flows to countries which are deemed that to be at high risk. We should, we should also expand the use of green bonds as, as, as fixed income investments to finance environmental projects, water and transport, uh, transport systems. So the, but the, the, the flow of, of, of new funding and products to large projects is, is, is often in the, hindered by lack of appropriate financing instruments. And this is where I think the GFIs can come in. You know, GFIs can, can provide advice and build capacity to harness the funds to finance, uh, you know, large uh, transformative projects. That, that way they'll be fulfilling their role as, as uh, their mandate as the honest brokers. I think that that's, that's where the, the, the action is. The, 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 they also, the, 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 I just wanted to add this as well. Uh, you know, to go to the police level. You know, at, at, at the police level, as uh, Jake was mentioning, the, 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 uh, how does funding work in, in, the, in, 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 a, in a police environment? You know, the, the funding should be, should be complemented by, 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 by policy, policy reform. So what, what we are saying is that, you know, the GFIs can support financial governance reforms in countries. You know, which would include the effective uh, legal and uh, regulatory frameworks to expand local financial system markets and sources of funds for private sector investment. The GFIs can also assist countries and regional organizations such as SADEC and others to unlock the value of these investments by addressing market inefficiencies in the financial sectors. They, they, they can also support um, uh, institutions uh, and also initial investors as well as stock markets and other capital markets stakeholders to broaden market participation and product offerings. Okay, um, and Andrew, uh, we need to bring in the other people to give in some comments. Uh, these are brilliant um, uh, observations. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes. And uh, 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 importantly, I'm, 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 I can close there. Thank you very much. Yeah, importantly for uh, highlighting the role of the uh, our private sector.
So let me call upon a, um, a, uh, the second panelist to for comments, say uh, uh, Grace um, uh, Chokunda. Grace, yeah. please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victor, and thank you, Dec, for the excellent presentation. Uh, sorry, my internet is not so good, so I will not use my video. Uh, just to uh, follow up what Andrew Mueva uh, has said, uh, just briefly, so I'll just uh, indicate how the bank operates. Yes, we have two windows, uh, one for private sector and one for public sector. So what we actually do with the public sector, we focus on supporting member countries in Africa to develop enabling environment, including policy. So that's what we do with our public sector window. With the private sector window, we deploy that to support uh, private sector commercially oriented investments. And I noticed from your presentation, actually, you've been following what we are doing. And as you say, we've, the, this kind of operation has evolved over time. But maybe you may not be up to date uh, now, but uh, what we do uh, in terms of our interventions, especially the non, what we call the non-sovereign, where we focus on private sector operations, we, for every investment we make, we have to do, do what we call ex-ante, ex-ante analysis. It's not only after the project closes, we have a whole project cycle evaluation. From the time we do the investment, we have to make sure that, for example, this development outcome, what do I mean by that? Will it have impact on the economy? Will it have a multiplier effect? Will it have all the uh, points you raised, an impact on, will it catalyze private sector investment? Is it going to crowd in private, more private sector investment? So we focus on additionality. So if we are going to do a transaction and it can be done by any other pure private sector banks, we don't do it. And that comes from our shareholders, our board. So we have to make sure that any investment meets those objectives. Uh, of course, it has to be uh, commercially viable. We look at risk. We look at uh, uh, environment, climate, etc. Uh, in terms of uh, how we cooperate with others, other DFIs, on the under on the project cycle, we have what you call post evaluation. We have what you call evaluation cooperation group, which is was established by OECD. So we try to coordinate and harmonize how we measure, how we evaluate it, how, what kind of indicators, when do we determine that the project has been successful. By successful, we mean, has it, has it been successful in terms of business case? Does it have, uh, did, it, did it influence the policy environment? Did it create jobs, ETC, taxation, name it. So that's what we do. And uh, we really focus on uh, SDGs. For example, now with the Africa, uh, this Afsa, um, Africa trade area uh, inter initiative, we also make sure that any intervention we do, we try to measure. So upfront, we look at, um, is it going to contribute to regional integration? How is it going to impact the new Africa-wide integration? How is it going to impact infrastructure? We also have several initiatives, for example, what Andrew Moeva said. We, we, don't, we, we are looking at how do we exit out of these countries? Are they able to generate uh, locally, uh, local revenues? We're trying to help them with capital markets development. For us, if you go, to, for example, if you go to the board and you have a transaction where you are doing an, a bond issuance and you catalyze capital markets and you create an environment where you you are ki kind of um, uh, you, you create a demonstration effect. That's a very big plus for us. So I, I, just to be brief, um, the points you raised are very valid. And as you mentioned, we are actually evolving. And whatever we do, we try to the extent possible to do some analytical work on a country level. It's not to the point of where we do impact assessment, where we can, we do, where there are sectors where we think that is need for more um, analytical and research specific, uh, for a specific sector, we do that. But of course, we are limited, resources are, are not ad lib. So we are limited by resources, we are very selective in our intervention, and 
there, there is definitely a lot we can do. We have our we, we, we feed into our research department. Our operations actually feed into our research department. Whatever evaluations, whatever lessons we learned, it's a whole cycle. So uh, to the point, yes, there is a lot that can be done to enhance research, but we are trying. And again, to point out, we do ex ante or evaluation. We have a detailed, a very elaborate results framework where we continuously follow to make sure that what we planned at the beginning is achieved. And if it's not happening, what remedial measures can be done? So we have a detailed results framework and most of the issues we measure are what's the development outcome? What's the impact? Is there taxation? Is there, are there jobs being created? And of course, the bottom line, is it going to pay back our money? So that's as far as the public private sector window is concerned. I'm sorry I had to be quick and summarize because I am not talking on behalf of the bank. I'm trying to just give you a brief overview of how our private sector operations uh, are, are run in the bank. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Absolutely spot on. And thanks for highlighting the fee the uh, feedback from research to uh, uh, private sector investment and from private sector investment back into uh, research. Uh, much appreciated. So I'll call upon uh, uh, the third uh, panelist, uh, uh, Joshua. Uh, please, uh, if you could limit your intervention to about five minutes, that would be much appreciated. Uh, Joshua, please All go right. ahead. All right, thank you very much, uh, Victor. And uh, congratulations and, and kudos to uh, Dick for the excellent uh, and insightful presentation. So uh, briefly, I, I know he's touched on a number of the issues uh, with, as far as DFIs uh, are, are con concerned, but we know I mean, basically that there are financial institutions or development agencies uh, which are involved in providing funds for startups or development projects in areas uh, in which traditional financial institutions uh, may want to shy away from, and, and they include multilateral DFIs, regional DFIs, bilateral DFIs, and of course, uh, national development banks. Now, I expect that these uh, different types of uh, DFIs uh, complement each other uh, to be able to provide uh, finance to support uh, private sector development and, and sustainable uh, growth in, in general. Uh, with respect to um, national development banks, uh, we believe that there are any type of financial institution that the national government has full or partial ownership. And, and that's a very important uh, point we need to, to make. And, and, and the World Bank actually put a cap at, a, at 30 percent, a minimum of 30 percent uh, government ownership uh, to qualify uh, that as a, a national um, development, uh, development bank. And of course, they tend to, they have a legal mandate to reach a uh, to achieve uh, socioeconomic uh, goals in a particular region, sector, or, or market. In terms of the need to establish DFI, you know, uh, uh, Dick uh, actually indicated and explained that uh, thoroughly. But we can look at the theoretical perspective in terms of uh, the theory of market uh, failure, the fact that markets are imperfect and there's a need for uh, DFIs. And the other important uh, uh, if you like theoretical stand is providing, or if you are like having a complementary uh, theoretical perspective, the fact that they provide a, a complementary role uh, to, um, if you like, a traditional uh, financial institution. Another important need for DFI is the fact that they are expected to provide um, counter cyclical uh, private financing and also to leverage private uh, capital. And we see that uh, most of them have become so uh, active around this time during this pandemic. And also another important point is the need for funds uh, to finance uh, the SDGs. Uh, with, I know in terms of their contributions that have been uh, discussed thoroughly, uh, also their funding, uh, Andrew mentioned that. One area we uh, need to focus uh, attention on is the business model that national development banks, for instance, use. Uh, you, you use retail, retail lending model, wholesale lending model, or a combination of, of both. Um, uh, they use loan guarantees and insurance, and also providing technical assistance. 
quickly in terms of uh, research ag agenda, uh, I think that the business models uh, is one area that research needs to focus on. What type of models will be suitable for particular types of uh, uh, national development bank? In Ghana uh, recently set up uh, a, national, a new national development bank. And there's a whole discussion regarding the model that is being used. And some of us are asking the question, what type of research went into um, arriving at that decision? Uh, we know both models have their pros and cons, but which one will really serve your purpose? Another area we can look at in terms of research is the role that GFIs are supposed to play in terms of financial sector uh, uh, development during a pandemic and post-pandemic. And then also, um, of course, I mentioned the complementary role that they are supposed to play, and, and that's an area that uh, research uh, needs to continue. And again, what type of regulatory framework is appropriate for national development? Uh, other models uh, who have it that they are self-regulated. The Uganda Development Bank, for instance, is self-regulated. Um, the new uh, development bank in Ghana is called the Development Bank Ghana, and it's supposed to be regulated by the central bank. Uh, and so you're asking, should they be self-regulated? Would the Basel III framework be appropriate for National Development Bank? These are areas that we need to, uh, questions that we need to uh, really answer. Then the role of National Development Bank in, in climate finance, um, and also in infrastructure development, and also promoting sustainable development. I know Grace, uh, uh, discuss the issue of impact evaluation. It's extremely important. Development banks are supposed to achieve certain development outcomes. And so when you provide the funding, how do we measure or ascertain whether the impact has really been made? We need to look at the project, evaluate the project, and ascertain whether the objectives have been uh, achieved. Uh, after interacting with a few of them, and, and I don't see that to be a major focus. I remember when I was a PhD student in, in Stellenbosch, uh, uh, my PhD student, uh, Professor Nicolas Biafre, will go and bring projects for, from uh, the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And our work is just to assess and evaluate the projects to ascertain whether the objectives for providing the funding have been achieved. Another important area, and, and, and lastly, uh, to make that point, is what kind of gov uh, governance structures or frameworks do you implement for National Development Bank? Political influence is so, so, so crucial. We're talking about government ownership. So gov would government uh, allow for, if you like, independent, uh, uh, an independent appointment process to be instituted in selecting board members? Uh, I was in Rwanda, uh, the, the, the Rwandan Development Bank, for instance, uh, has a, a board chair, though appointed by the, the president, is expected to be an independent uh, board member. And, I, and I'm told that he came with his own terms, that if he's going to do this work, these things must be in place. He doesn't want change of government, meaning you change the board chair. So, we need to be very clear on what structures we put in place to make sure that these institutions have right and proper governance structures so they can they can operate and function accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for uh, uh, those thoughts and uh, good reflections. And importantly, uh, the last one on the governance uh, uh, of the DFI is to reflect uh, on a delivering private sector uh, agenda. Um, it's now my pleasure to call upon a, a, another set of uh, panelists uh, who will be uh, sharing with us their reflections uh, on a dark um, uh, inaugural lecture and their reflection based on uh, recent research. Uh, we are pleased to have with us a uh, Paddy Carter uh, uh, who uh, joined SDC CDC as a director of research and policy in May 2019 uh, and is in that position. 
uh, Paddy has a PhD in economics uh, uh, from the University of uh, Bristol uh, and also has uh, been prolific uh, in producing research for, um, uh, for uh, related to uh, these issues. Uh, his remarks will be based on a, a, um, a strategy paper uh, that was released uh, in November uh, last year. And secondly, we'll have uh, uh, Nina Fenton, uh, who is a senior economist at the European Investment Bank, AIB, specializes in areas of finance and therefore relevant to this topic today. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Oxford, and her remarks will be based on AIB Banking in Africa report released in December last year. And uh, finally, we'll have uh, comments from Anil Grigore, who is the Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the International Finance Corporation, uh, the private investment arm um, of the World Bank Group. And it has um, um, MA and MSc degrees in economics from Cambridge and also from Oxford, and also an MBA from Georgetown. And uh, his remarks will be based on ongoing uh, uh, research at the IFC. Uh, so I'll be calling upon uh, uh, Pade, Nina, and Neil. Just uh, if you could uh, limit uh, uh, this is an impossible task <laughs> to limit your presence for about five minutes. That would be much appreciated. So we go in that order. Okay, Paddy, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, thank you, Dirk, for inviting me to speak today. And hello, everybody. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about how DFIs are changing. Uh, so I'm going to be very parochial and talk about how CDC uh, is changing. And then uh, in keeping with the theme of the uh, talk, I'm, I'm going to talk, say a few words about um, future research directions. Now, maybe the first thing I should mention is that our name is changing. Uh, we're going to become British International Investment. Um, that has raised concerns in some quarters that that means we will be more about promoting uh, British interests and less about uh, development. So I want to assure you that whilst everybody loves a win-win, um, there is nothing in our investment policy or strategy to that effect. Uh, okay, next slide, please, um, Meng. So um, we have a new strategy. Uh, here are those three words that our, our strategy is built around, productive, sustainable, uh, and inclusive. Uh, there's nothing particularly original uh, in uh, focusing on what uh, is usually called inclusive, sustainable growth. So um, any novelty that we can lay claim to will consist uh, in how we operationalize uh, these uh, fine words. Um, I'm not going to try and talk about that now, uh, but our strategy document is available uh, on our website. And if you keep an eye on our comms, uh, we're going to have a few more things to say about this coming soon. So what I want to talk about really is just a bit about what's what stayed the same and, um, and what's changed. Uh, so how are things changing? So the first thing is that we are increasingly seen as a major part of the UK government's uh, response to climate change and a uh, a, a vehicle for climate investing. So that inevitably pushes us a bit more towards the larger carbon intensive um, middle income countries uh, where you can make the most difference uh, to carbon emissions by uh, replacing fossil with uh, renewables. Um, now, our, our, our activities are growing. So this doesn't mean we'll be doing less of anything else in absolute terms. It means we will just be doing uh, more uh, with more. Um, and as part of that, we have expanded our geographies. So we will now be doing climate investing in um, Southeast Asia when previously we were only Africa and uh, South Asia. Now, when we think about climate, we do use the official um, MDB climate finance uh, criteria. But I think this is something that is changing for us and changing, I anticipate, for other DFIs. We now carbon footprint all our investments. Um, we are in the future, I think, going to be having to think very carefully about uh, carbon budgeting. And the more you think about that, the more you realise what quite dramatic implications it could have for DFI's activities if we have to demonstrate that our portfolios are on a path um, to net zero by on a, on a particular schedule. Um, and we have an impact scoring tool and we, we also consider the uh, environmental aspects of every single investment now. Uh, whether it's climate finance or not. So I think that's quite a significant change. Now, we've always, in terms of continuity, of course, we've always thought about what you might call the forward effects of investments from infrastructure and um, uh, banks, uh, the financial sector. But I think that in the new strategy, we are paying a bit more attention to 
forward effects more generally uh, from intermediate goods and other important inputs to production. And uh, like everybody else, we're also thinking about innovation, catalyzing markets and trying to have positive spillovers uh, in that way. Um, for the first time, we're being more explicit about the ownership and management of the businesses that um, we invest in. Uh, lots of DFIs are signed up with something called the 2X Initiative, uh, which pays attention to whether uh, the businesses are owned and managed by women. Uh, we are introducing a new initiative which we're calling BOLD, which stands for um, Black Ownership and Leadership uh, for Development. And uh, we did that uh, in part um, in response to uh, Black Lives Matter and all the recent events, but also we looked at our portfolio and we realised that really quite a shocking percentage of our investments in Africa were owned by white expatriates. Uh, and so we're, we are trying to change that. And lastly, one thing that I think um, is worth noticing is that we're going to take a slightly different approach towards investing in fragile and conflict afflicted states. And we're going to be relying more <clears throat> on local partners who are closer, uh, you know, to the to, uh, and rather than trying to manage things directly from London, which we think is has been less to, less successful. So uh, that's a bit of a change. Um, next slide. Uh, please. So um, in we're short on time, so I won't try and, and talk about everything on this slide. Um, I was pleased to discover that without conferring with Dirk, there was um, quite a lot in common between what he had to say and what I'm uh, putting up here. So when it comes to climate investing, I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, the emphasis on mobilizing private capital is starting to have a bit of a reaction. And maybe there are people at SOAS who are part of that. And there are concerns about financialization. Uh, the term the Wall Street consensus has been uh, coined. Uh, I think that there is more that we could all use uh, to kind of find out both theoretically and empirically about, you know, why is where is private finance and private ownership a good idea? Where might public ownership and public finance be a good idea? Um, I think we might want to think about who is going to own all these uh, fossil assets if everybody is busy divesting them to meet their um, carbon budgets. Uh, we um, we also want to be thinking about, uh, I mean, everybody, adaptation and resilience, everybody is terrifically recognises the importance, but I think we have a lot to learn about what we can actually invest in. And if we cannot take a demand led approach and just sort of rely on things coming to us, then how do we create opportunities? So um, when it comes to mobilisation, and this is part actually uh, in response to concerns about uh, um, what I just said about mobilizing private finance for climate. And I think that, you know, we could we all need to learn more about um, when is it work? When is it when is it a good use of our money uh, in some sense paying to induce private co-investment? Um, who benefits from it? You know, is this about making BlackRock asset management better off or is this about making African citizens better off? And what's the evidence? Um, there and maybe which are the most effective mechanisms in different circumstances that, that might solve some of these problems. Um, now, uh, another thing that's happened with all this emphasis on mobilization is that uh, people have started to notice uh, that uh, maybe it's somewhat disappointing um, relative to earlier uh, kind of rhetorical aspirations uh, to do with billions and trillions. Um, that conversation very quickly got on to this um, idea that, well, maybe it's not the lack of money that's the problem. It's the lack of uh, projects, and that in turn has led DFIs towards attempts to um, create more projects. And that's got a lot to do with what Dirk was saying about, uh, you know, um, coordination and working with uh, policymakers. I think that uh, I hope I'm not stealing any of his thunder here, but um, the IFC has really led the way here um, with, uh, well, as far as I know, uh, putting out, putting resources and thought into upstream um, advisory. CDC is asking itself whether we could be doing more there too. And I think that there's a lot that we need to find out about, you know, what's, what works best and also what is it realistic to expect? Because you can have sort of hype cycles where everybody gets overexcited and then there's a, like a backlash when it didn't meet uh, initial expectations. So I think being realistic uh, is important um, there. Uh, Maybe I'll just try one more thing on this slide and then I better wrap up. And that is about the familiar idea of um, financing gaps. Uh, I would love us to have a bit more than, you know, just surveys where you ask a business is raising finance uh, a problem. Um, I mean, I think that we would like more granular uh, evidence about where, you know, where in what market segments are there shortages of capital uh, um, 
along with Tanner Death, I've put on the slide. I think that a lot of CDC has a very firmly believed, but perhaps under evidenced uh, belief that risk bearing capital equity uh, is especially important. Uh, that's why we've always tried to build the private equity uh, uh, ecosystem in the countries uh, where we invest. Uh, and uh, we could, there's lots more we could learn about whether that has had the uh, intended benefits. So some of what I've put on this slide are things for researchers to help us find the answers to. I think some of it is about DFIs experimenting um, themselves and sort of exploring what they're capable of uh, through what we do. Um, I'm going to stop to try and stay on time. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, Pade. I think those are indeed interesting research questions and uh, researchers will start now rolling their sleeves ready to go into them. Uh, so uh, next, let me call upon Nina. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to contribute to this debate. Um, it's been incredibly rich and challenging, so um, I was kind of struggling to know where to start. But um, since Dirk asked me to focus on the Finance in Africa publication, that's where I'm going to start. So uh, I'm going to give a few of the key findings from that and then lead into a few ideas about what it means for the DFIs, for EIB, um, both in terms of operational strategy and um, in terms of our research agenda. Um, before I start, just to introduce EIB, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are the Bank of the European Union, um, and as such, most of our investment is inside the EU. Um, but actually, we do about 10% outside um, in pursuit of policy objectives of the EU. Um, so, you know, in general, the SDG agenda um, with the overarching goal of um, helping uh, our partner countries to, to reduce and eliminate poverty. Um, so that's about 10 percent. So it's actually quite a large balance sheet. And Africa is um, a big focus um, for us. Um, we work with public and private sector partners, a lot of which are in the financial sector. So one of the things we do to support our operations is an annual report on finance in Africa, where we take a look at the financial sector, so banks, microfinance and private equity to see, you know, what is the situation, what are the risks, what are the challenges and, and what are the opportunities uh, coming up. So I thought it might be a nice way to kind of contextualize, contextualize where we stand today as DFIs, um, you know, in hopefully towards the end of an unprecedented pandemic crisis, but very much in the middle of, of a climate crisis and, and a lot of other challenges. Um, so I would say that the three main findings that come out, um, firstly, we were actually really pleased. Um, our publication is based on a survey of around 80 banks across Africa. And we were really pleased to see coming out of that and also out of other data sources, for example, the IMF um, and other sources, that the financial sectors have actually been really resilient. Um, so going into the crisis, banks and also microfinance were much better capitalized than they were, say, in 2008. And most of the banks we were talking to, at least at the beginning of 2021, they were not mentioning lack of liquidity as a, as a problem. And we haven't seen a sort of string of bank failures coming up. Um, even among the microfinance, they've been quite resilient. And private equity firms, which we also in, uh, funds which we also investigated, have continued um, investing in Africa during the crisis. Um, on the other hand, we saw even at the start of 2021, when we were doing the, the survey, and increasingly so as we see new data coming out from the IMF and from, from other secondary data sources, um, that problems with asset quality are of course starting to crystallize. And I mean, this is obvious, right? We know from enterprise survey data carried out during the crisis that firms are beginning to go bankrupt, you know, in, in the worst case, um, or, you know, starting to default or be delayed on the repayment. And this is of course, translating into asset quality problems for the banks and for the microfinance. Um, and that's going to make them make it hard for them, even as the recovery starts to take off, to focus on lending, because they need to deal with those loans that are not repaying or that have to be written off while maintaining their capital buffers. Um, of course, this is far from being unique to Africa, um, but because the level of NPLs, non-performing loans, were relatively high relative to other regions going into the crisis, um, 
this is something that, that you know, it's a concern that this could really set back the lending. And of course, we know um, from previous experience and also from our understanding of sort of the barriers and market failures that we see there on the ground, um, that these financing constraints can really hit exactly where finance is needed for an inclusive recovery. So, for example, for SMEs, um, for women-led enterprises and for people in poor and remote areas. These are the kind of groups that are seen as riskier by banks um, and that are harder to reach even for microfinance institutions. And, uh, you know, if banks and microfinance start focusing on the sort of more established, less risky clients, then these are the ones that are really going to, to see um, a cutback in access. Um, and even among the private equity funds, um, we saw that they continued to invest during the crisis, but we did see a major reduction in fundraising. So we can see that there is a risk that this will lead to a cutback in availability of, of finance, just where actually this is the kind of finance that really goes to startups, to innovative firms. Um, so there are really risks that there is going to be a cutback in finance for innovation and, and for these harder to reach groups. Um, so the situation is extremely challenging. Um, but I think the third thing that we found was that there's still a very strong potential in Africa. And I think a number of the speakers have, have really alluded to this. Um, and there's an important role that the financial sector is playing and can continue to play in driving a, a smart and inclusive and green recovery. Um, so in the report, we took particularly deep dives into digital and green finance, um, which really show that potential. So we know that African innovators have really led the shift towards digital finance. Um, and we saw in our survey that the traditional lenders, the banks are, are going in that direction. They've been pushed by the crisis to accelerate digitalization. And this can drive further improvements in access to finance and financial inclusion and indeed the overall performance of the financial sectors. We see also green finance. We worked on this actually with, with ODI. Um, we see a big potential there. We heard from the banks that it's an area they're very interested in, in looking into. It's something they want to explore. Um, but of course, there are a number of barriers in their way, um, you know, in order to take up those opportunities. Um, OK, so those were kind of the key messages. And what does this mean now for, for EIB as a DFI and, and for others? Um, I think the first thing I would say is that it's clear that there are huge opportunities and that we have a big role to play, right, in working with the private sector, um, in really complementing their efforts and in catalyzing finance. As Dirk said, you know, the capital is there. We have capital, the capital is out there, and it's a question of, you know, where can we play the most important role in kind of really funneling that to the, the places where it can have the biggest impact. And I think, you know, in this situation, uh, we all need to step up and, and really work together to see how we can do that best. The second thing is that I think there needs to be an increased focus in order to make that work on these specific market failures. I think, you know, it's always been EIB's mission to, you know, be additional to address market failures. But in the past, you know, there was kind of this sometimes an assumption that lack of access to long term capital is a market failure in itself. That's not any more the case. We really need to be more specific. You know, why is there a failure there? Which is the best way of addressing that? What are the other failures we're seeing? Are there particular groups that are being left behind, are being left out? Is it women? Is it young people? Is it the smallest enterprises? Um, and figure out what it is that we can do most effectively to address them. And here, of course, climate is probably for us the most important uh, market failure that we see. We are the climate bank, and that is something that we're going to continue focusing on and, and really um, up our, our ambition. The third thing I would say is that, you know, all of this implies a greater need for blended finance um, and for, you know, new ways of doing things which require that blended finance, right? As a bank, um, you know, there's we have a lot of um, risk management policies in place. So, you know, if we want to take a more innovative approach and, you know, do more with guarantees, you know, go into riskier segments, we need the blended finance to be able to do that. And that's something we're working on increasingly with partners, usually the, the European Commission, um, to really get access to that kind of the finance that allows us to, to bring in sort of more innovative um, instruments and, and make them work. Um, of course, this use of blended finance, this is public money, essentially. And this, as well as, you know, just Yet other trends in the market push us more and more to the importance of impact assessment, which is something that Dirk uh, talked about a lot. Um, you know, I, I won't go into detail, but at EIB, you know, we have 
a lot of different impact assessment methods underway. We have the results monitoring that applies to every single project. We do quite a lot and increasingly so on microeconomic impact assessment and also macro modeling. Inside, we have a very well established model and we're, we're working with the other EDFIs um, to take that outside the EU. This is just becoming much more important. You know, the more we're using blended finance, um, because this is an issue of transparency and accountability, and also the more we're moving into innovative tools and instruments, because, you know, if something is innovative, it's particularly important to know, is it working and, and to keep track. Um, I guess also, you know, the, the situation at the moment is particularly fast changing um, and we really need to keep track. So I think this emphasizes for me the importance, not just of this impact assessment stream, but of this kind of macroeconomic and sector, particularly financial sector uh, based monitoring. We do a lot of that in our department because we're also monitoring macro and financial sector risk for all of the countries where we operate. Um, but I think this is something that we're putting a lot of emphasis on at the moment because we really need to, to understand the trends. Um, Dirk mentioned also the need to be up to date with policy. Um, I completely agree there, but we have to be quite smart about how to engage in the policy debate. Um, so what we do at the EIB is we work a lot with various different partners, including um, most recently we have a lot of cooperation going on with the IMF. Um, I think the, the crisis has really shown the importance of this kind of the policy support and the work that the IMF has done. Um, the fact that the banks in Africa were much better prepared um, for this crisis than for others, I think has really shown, you know, a step up in their own um, monitoring for, at the level of the central banks um, and the banks themselves. Um, and that's something that we continue to support through the partnership with the IMF. Um, finally, I think, you know, for me, research, this sounds a little airy fairy, but I think it's important to consider research, not just as um, a kind of, input output process where we put in a survey and we put in some money for consultancy and we get out a final report. Um, but really as like a kind of process and a way of listening and, you know, it's really about finding out what's going on on the ground. So, you know, for us, the finance in Africa, it was a chance to listen to what our clients and potential client banks are, are saying, you know, what are their needs? Um, what can we do to support them? But also, I think we've learned so much through interacting with partners um, as we've put together the report. We worked very closely with um, colleagues at the Africa, African Development Bank and the Making Finance Work for Africa um, partnership, and also with ODI, with uh, CGAP on the microfinance. And I think every time we have a conversation, uh, we're learning a little bit more and then feeding back to our operational colleagues. Um, and I think, you know, we've potentially even more since we brought out the report and we've been able to share some of the findings and, and get feedback. And I think today is another step in that process. So, um, yeah, I hope the conversation will continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nina. Brilliant ideas. And you did whet our appetite uh, uh, in terms of the uh, issues we should look into. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, finally, I call upon you, Nail. I hope that um, you could summarize your intervention uh, in about uh, five minutes. Next. Great. Thank you, uh, Victor. Thank you to Sarah for hosting this discussion. It's been a very rich discussion, which shows what an important and complex research agenda we have. So let me quickly try and make a few points which haven't already been made in the, the very interesting interventions so far. As Dirk has described, DFIs have moved from the margins to the center of the discussion on how to finance the SDGs and the climate change goals. And I think the climate change agenda will pull DFIs towards doing more in larger middle income countries. But the SDG agenda will pull DFIs back towards low income countries, most of which are in Africa. Now, these are the countries which have the least capacity to finance the SDGs through domestic resource mobilization. An analysis we published in 2019 showed that most middle income countries could close their SDG financing gaps with a modest increase in tax effort to finance public spending. Not so in the low income countries, so this is where increasing private investment can make the greatest contribution to the achievements of the SDGs. But these countries are also some of the most difficult environments to invest in, not just because the business enabling environment is commonly weak, but because of the lack of investable firms. Now, by investable, I mean formal firms of sufficient scale and capacity to make use of external equity and take on long-term debt 
are the prospects for profitable growth which will enable them to service that debt and provide a return to investors. Such firms are the core clientele of DFIs. So if you want to understand the operations of DFIs today and in the future, I think you really need to understand their addressable market of investable firms. As we explored in our book, Making It Big, such large formal firms are essential to the growth of the private sector in lower middle income countries, but they, in my view, have not received sufficient attention either in research or in DFI investment strategy. They're often seen as predatory or sleepy. So DFIs like to promote their MSME financing, but we're often almost apologetic to talk about our investments in large firms. But the cure for predatory or sleepy large firms is not more SMEs, it's more large firms to compete with them, forcing them to become more dynamic. And more large firms means more opportunities for SMEs in their value chain. McKinsey has highlighted how few of these large firms there are in Africa. In 2018, there were less than 400 firms in the whole continent with revenues of more than a billion dollars a year, and most of those were in South Africa. So it turns out there isn't a missing middle in the private sector in Africa, there's a missing top. So this is both the opportunity and the challenge for DFIs in Africa. The opportunity is that DFIs have the financial and advisory products which large firms need to grow. But the challenge is that there are so few of these large formal firms in low income African countries to begin with, that DFIs can find themselves falling over each other to finance the same handful of firms. So this is an important driver behind IFC's recent strategic shift known as IFC 3.0. Recognizing that there aren't enough investment opportunities, we've shifted more of our resources into upstream market development and opportunity development. Now we think there will be positive spillover effects from this work for other DFIs who will also benefit from the investment opportunities so created, and no doubt there will also be some grumbling about free riding. So what does this mean for a research agenda which will inform our work in Africa? I want to highlight two things. First, from what I've said, you can see that we need more research into the origins and growth paths of the large firms that we invest in. I think development research has neglected large firms in favor of MSEs, MSMEs, partly because if you study micro enterprises, you can get large enough sample sizes for RCTs and for statistical inference. Studying large firms in low income countries presents research challenges because of the small number of observations. But I think as researchers, you need to take on this challenge, which includes the hard work of getting access to business census data, tax records and other information on the behavior of formal sector firms. And secondly, we need more research into the dynamics of market development. I'm afraid that too much of what passes for private sector development strategies and exercise in comparative statics. You do a diagnostic of the business enabling environment or the financial markets or whatever, and then you say, okay, now we need to close the gaps or remove the binding constraint or fix the market failure. And you think the job is done as if it's moving from one static state to another. But as Dirk described, we actually need an understanding of how markets and firms develop together. At the sector level, this includes analysis of industrialization processes. At the micro level, it includes an understanding of the process of market entry, competition, innovation and exit. And the ODI studies that Dirk was involved in on sector transformation, I think, are a good step in this direction. Okay. And this kind of research will help us figure out how to do the upstream opportunity development better. Lastly, I want to point out that in doing so, I think we could draw more on neo Schumpeterian endogenous growth theories. It seems to me that these theories ask the right questions about how firms and markets emerge and evolve over time. They put spillovers, network effects, clusters, innovation and knowledge at the centre of the growth process. We talk about these things in DFIs, but without a robust analytical framework. Surely many African markets are right for this kind of creative destruction replacing a slew of unproductive, slow growing SMEs with a handful of productive, innovative large firms which compete internationally. So the question for DFIs is what is the sequence and set of complementary interventions working with government policy and public investment alongside DFI investment, which can promote this kind of restructuring of African economies? At IFC, 
we think this kind of market development is so important that we added a second dimension to our assessment of development impact. In our AIM system, we rate our investments and advisory projects both on their direct contributions to things like jobs created and services provided and on their contribution to market development. And this then drives investment selection. To make these kinds of assessment more vigorous and credible, we need better research foundations which provide a basis for estimating the market impacts of DFI investments. For years, we've relied on poetry, talking about catalytic effects and demonstration effects and crowding in, but we need more hard evidence on the existence and scale of such effects, looking at sequences of complementary activities rather than individual investments. There's no doubt that Africa will remain an area of strategic focus for many DFIs, and there's great scope for us to improve our effectiveness by improving our understanding of these important issues. So I'm glad to see talented researchers like Dirk and colleagues at SOAS directing their attention to these important research questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Anil, uh, for highlighting those important issues uh, quite spot on. And uh, a, there's a high degree of um, a, a synchronized information, uh, not only from Doug, uh, but also uh, from Andrew, Grace, Joshua, uh, Padenina, and finally Nail. So um, let me open up uh, uh, the floor for uh, comments. Um, um, I know we are running out of time. But maybe uh, what would be useful is just to say a couple of hands, comments, quick comments, just right to the point. Uh, and then maybe uh, if you want to direct your question or comment to a, um, uh, either the six panelists or to Dak, you could say so. So let me see. Um, um, to raise your hand, there is um, a button on the top right hand corner and uh, there is a raise hand you press, just like the one that appears on my side now and then I'll call upon you. Okay, so I see uh, my own hand up uh, and the second hand uh, from a uh, from a Fiwa. Okay, uh, Fiwa, please go ahead. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I actually raised my question in the chat. Yes, so, I So, yeah, but I'm I'm happy to to just read it out to everyone if that's okay. It's a bit long. Maybe summarize it in a couple of words. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, basically, uh, the first speaker mentioned that dysfunctional political economies can negatively impact the profitability of investments. There's a perception that an increasing number of investments, such as the recently shut down Mara cell phone plant in Durban, which has now gone on auction are beginning to escape the anomaly categorization in terms of failed investments. So, I mean, the issues with substandard governance structures and skill sort shortages dominating these DFIs, coupled with societal impatience, which could eventually influence widespread social unrest across the African continent. Um, what, what are your thoughts? And just to be clear, my name is Rafilo Malika. Sorry, I don't know why it's not reflecting properly. Uh, that's that's um, um, that's a, a perfect. Okay, uh, uh, maybe um, any further comments? Or uh, maybe um, yeah, there are there are some. Um, let me also mention some two other uh, uh, comments in the chat. Um, uh, uh, yes, you you did add also that. Um, uh, that in Africa we seem to be always falling behind in terms of the research and implementation of what actually works. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, agree. Uh, there is observation also by uh, Richard, uh, Richard Alexander, a uh, important question of whether Basel III is appropriate in certain African states at all. And further, uh, a question uh, from Richard to Nina, to what extent does EIB collaborate with the national development banks of member states, e.g. Uh, uh, in France or Francophone Africa. I think Nina actually mentioned some of those collaboration with FDB and maybe for some countries. OK, um, let me also uh, take, um, I think there is another hand that's gone up uh, from Jess Brown. Jess, yeah, please go um, ahead. Um, really, really interesting panel and interesting discussion. Um, I was really interested in what Paddy has to say 
um, about the bold initiative at CDC to found um, the I'm at Shell Foundation. And we've got like a local entrepreneur strategy and we found especially during the pandemic, expat founders were obviously going home and not really saying where their enterprises were and the impact that that had on um, results and investments. And also it'd be interesting to know whether um, investing into local founders does yield better returns on investments because they have like a better understanding of the market, they understand the complexities of like the political issues and stuff. Um, so yeah, more of a comment than a question. Yeah, and a useful comment uh, in a way because, uh, you know, COVID, the pandemic has depressed a lot of things, but also with depressed investments uh, and understanding. Okay, so maybe, um, um, Edak, do you want to uh, shed light on some of these? Uh, um, special second question. Uh, thank you, Victor. Um, I'm also, um, uh, I can see the time as well, so I won't, uh, I will be short. And also, apology, I, I, I I can't have access to the chat for some reason. I, many apologies. I would have been frantically typing because um, uh, uh, there were there was such a rich discussion and there were so many issues that have been been highlighted, and um, uh, and also sort of by all the by all the, uh, the speakers. And I think there is um, a sort of a gap. And there was one of the questions about what works that we're falling behind. I think. Um, I mean, in part, that basically just reflects the reality that, that there are changes and changes in policies and changes in structures and, and, and change in doing things differently. And we need to assess whether it works or not. And yeah, you need to have to, the evidence needs to come in and then you can assess it. And I think that's also sort of with blending. So as, as we are, uh, so just, uh, Nino is talking about the blending. I think that's something that needs to be looked at um, in more detail and to sort of see well, what works um, and, and, and then move forward. The other is about this upstream advisory work, which I think is really exciting. Both IFC and also uh, sort of for PETI, uh, for the PAI, was, we're also talking about and sort of in what context works, does what, what work best. Um, and and I think also Grace and Andrew were talking, Andrew, I think, was talking about working in partnerships uh, with countries. And um, and so so I think that that interaction is something we need to know much more about. I do so do, do think though that, that we're still very timid in the uh, sort of the, that DFIs um, are not engaging that, uh, that much in the policy in the policy discussions and and working with the policy discussions. And I think that's something that that um, um, uh, so working with uh, le leaders um, and I think that and, and sort of that sequencing that Neil was talking about. I think that is something that um, that that needs to be looked at um, and perhaps. One way in which we can gain evidence is what uh, the first uh, the questioner, um, uh, Viva, uh, you were asking about a failure. I don't know that particular failure. I've, I've written a little bit about um, at some point one investment in, in one cement plant um, uh, uh, by one DFI, um, and that went went wrong. And my um, and that could have been sort of governance structures of the of the investment, but it, I think it was also to do with policy changes in another country actually. So. Um, uh, which which affected the profitability of 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 a of a particular uh, investment, and there I think the policy context was was absolutely crucial. So there was a policy change in another country which affected the profitability of uh, of that particular cement plant, and I think the um, so understanding the policy context and working with the policy may uh, uh, may have uh, been able to sort of uh, uh, to sort of um, uh, 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 work, make sure that the investment worked better or, or, or not. And I think that is the, uh, that's perhaps the hypothesis and that we also need to work, uh, we do need to assess failures as well as, as, uh, as successful cases. Um, I, I can say it a, a bit more, Basel 3, I think that's, that's a live yeah, question. Yeah, um, yeah, as uh, we you know, are, are running uh, short of time, a, uh, Cleo Rosa Ines, would you be able to summarize your question or intervention in one sentence? Yes, thanks, Victor. I'll try very brief. I just want to say something optimistic um, and picking up on Neil's point about institutions and markets and especially CDC's point about being on the ground. I'm worried we might miss things that are really happening out there. So I'm so glad that they're going to be out there um, because I think there's a lot of market creating innovation going on uh, in Africa. You know, do you remember that book 
in the early 2000s, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. There was a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, opportunities uh, if, if you could only make products that poor people wanted to buy. And now we see a lot of things happening in tech, especially. Um, and I think DFIs are sometimes too remote from where people are and what they're actually doing. And we're seeing this now a lot in tech firms. And it's it's exciting, you know, and so, I mean, I understand what Neil was saying about big firms, but I think a lot of little firms are being born and we might miss them. So I'm glad that, um, I'm, and I've seen now also has offices, um, you know, closer to the people. And I, I think, yeah, I, I'm optimistic. I think there's a lot going on that, and if we're not really on the ground, we might, we might miss it. And it's exciting. So thanks for the discussion. Uh, thanks very much. And indeed, this consistent what uh, Grace is doing in the Eastern African region, I know that she's hands-on on some of those uh, uh, small farms. Uh, Marietta Stephen, would you be able to also uh, uh, summarize in one sentence? Thank you so much. I've been following this discussion. Mine is just to encourage and to bring into attention on the financial institutions to embrace uh, evidence-based approach when they are uh, measuring their, their let's say, in, uh, impacts of the performance and also make sure they bring into consideration setting targets and indicators where they should be in a position to follow up at least to measure their performance and the ongoing progress of the let's say performance uh, instead of doing the impact at the end of the project I, I mean at the end of their investment and that will actually inform where they are going wrong and so that they can put mitigation measures early enough thank you Thank you very much, Marietta. I think the point was also mirrored in uh, Grace's intervention as well as Nina's intervention. But uh, Nina, um, uh, you, you could have the final word uh, in. No, I just, uh, someone was asking about uh, co-financing and yes. the very quick answer. Yes, we co-finance a lot. I don't have the exact numbers, but I know that we work a lot together with the African Development Bank and with the French Development Agency. AFD. I wasn't quite sure which one was referred to in the question. We also work a lot with uh, public development banks in Africa. Um, we've even uh, the Development Bank of Ghana. Um, we were involved in, in setting that up um, and, and a number of others. Um, and just Marietta was mentioning, I think, the, the need to be on the ground. That is something we're also moving towards. Uh, so recently we launched uh, EIB Global, which is um, you know a part of the EIB group that's going to really focus on development. And one of our sort of aspirations there is to have more people on the ground. Um, we've set up a new hub um, for East Africa in Nairobi, which is kind of the, the first step in that direction. So you're absolutely right. And I think we all need to work on it. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. Uh, this is uh, indeed how a very successful inaugural lecture should be. It opens up all questions, it opens up all opportunities. It's the start of uh, a dialogue and a continued exchange of ideas among all the uh, participants here. So let me uh, thank you, Doug, uh, for a very inspiring you know, your lecture. Let me also thank your friends and family who are with us. Uh, also, let me thank the particip the uh, panelists, uh, Andrew, Grace, Joshua, Pade, Nina, Nair, uh, who have been able to give us brilliant ideas um, that um, are very much shed more light on what Doug um, uh, did espouse uh, in the I Know Your Lecture. And I thank you all for being able to make it a, uh, for the you know last uh, uh, two hours uh, and uh, we run uh, out of space by two minutes but I think it's been so exciting and this is the start of the inaugural lectures that will be giving further inaugural lectures as we go so thank you very much and thank you indeed uh, we see you uh, shortly thank you thank you <laughs>